So welcome to the lecture on DNA sequencing from CV 182. And just a reminder, don't distribute uh, the course materials to others outside the class. And so the learning objectives today is really just to understand the uh, advantages and disadvantages of the kind of three main sequencing technologies that um, a lot of people use today, uh, namely made by Illumina PacBio Nanopore. Uh, and have some broad understanding of, of how they work. Um, and also we, we want to understand when and, and why you would use long versus short read sequencing because uh, long and short read sequencing have their own advantages and disadvantages in general. And so the goal of DNA sequencing at kind of a super basic level is really just to sequence a, a chunk of, of DNA, essentially find the complete sequence of, of bases uh, in the particular sequence. And the, the challenge to sequencing really is that there, there basically is no sequencing technology today that can really just take in, a, say, a genome sequence of arbitrary length and just spit out its, its sequence uh, with high accuracy anyways uh, as output in, in one kind of run. And so typical sequencing technologies, depending on which one you use, uh, can really only sequence, say, like a couple hundred base pairs or up to, say, like, 10 KB uh, bases at a time, um, you know, more typically, uh, you know, if you're using like Illumina sequencing machines, you're, you're typically sequencing somewhere on the order of less than a few hundred base pairs. And so as you've probably heard, the cost of sequencing genomes has rapidly decreased over the past few decades. And so just to give you an illustration, this is a graph of the cost of sequencing, say the human genome. Uh, and you can see that back in 2001, when the first draft of the human genome was released, uh, the cost of the whole sequencing project was somewhere on the order of like $100 million. And so that's in contrast to when the uh, first next-gen sequencing uh, machines by Illumina came out in roughly 2007. And you can see at that point, that was when the costs really started rapidly declining. Uh, and if you fast forward a little bit to 2015, you can see that that was when we first started achieving the so-called $1,000 genome, where sequencing a genome could cost roughly on the order of $1,000. And so these numbers are somewhat misleading because uh, the cost of sequencing a genome kind of depends on how deeply you sequence it. And so uh, if you, you know, the deeper you sequence a genome, the more it's going to cost, but the more accurate your, your genome is going to be uh, because you have more and more kind of reads covering any given region of the genome. Uh, but this graph really just serves to illustrate that the cost of sequencing overall is just really rapidly declined. And so in terms of the steps uh, for performing, for example, genome sequencing, there's kind of three really broad steps uh, involved. First, you obviously have to prepare a DNA library uh, from a particular organism or cell of interest. Uh, then you need to do sequencing via any number of technologies that we'll talk about later in this lecture. And then the basic output from uh, you know, your sequencing machine is basically a set of one or more reads. Uh, they give you some, uh, they give you a, a fragment of your original genome or sequence that you're trying to, to characterize. And so in terms of uh, generating a DNA library, uh, the basic steps, uh, which again kind of depend on the precise technology you're using, but the general steps involve uh, basically extracting uh, some kind of template DNA or more or genome uh, from a bunch of cells, uh, followed by fragmentation, because as I explained earlier in this lecture, um, it's, you know, current technologies as of today anyways, uh, are not able to sequence an entire genome in general, uh, all in one go. And so typically you have to somehow fragment your original genome into smaller pieces and then sequence the individual pieces. And so this fragmentation can be done by any number of ways, in, including mechanical shearing uh, versus sonication or uh, enzyme digestion. Uh, so once you fragment your uh, input DNA sequence into a bunch of fragments, uh, you typically need to add adapters. And so what these adapters are exactly kind of, again, depend on your technology. And so when we start talking about Illumina sequencing, for example, we'll talk about what exactly goes into those adapters. But basically, generally speaking, uh, adapters generally include uh, sequences that help you, for example, do amplification. Uh, 
So they might contain like primer sites, um, or for example, they might contain complementary sites, which allow you to um, kind of bind these fragments to some kind of like fixed platform. So in, in the Lumina's case, uh, Lumina uses a technology called FlowCell, uh, which we'll talk about in a second. Uh, and basically the, the role of the adapters is to help bind and fix um, these reads to this, to this flow cell so that you can then do sequencing. But once you've done your, once you've added your adapters, uh, basically there's optionally a library amplification step where you might use, for example, PCR to uh, increase the amount of genomic material you have uh, before you do the sequencing. And so generally speaking, when you are constructing your library, uh, there's a number of considerations that you, you generally have to make. So first of which is obviously the length uh, of your fragments. And so certain technologies like Illumina's sequencing by synthesis technology generally uh, are used for sequencing shorter reads. And so there you might, uh, you might need to do more fragmentation in order to basically uh, construct shorter reads for Illumina sequencing. Whereas other technologies like Nanopore uh, can sequence much longer reads and so uh, you basically need less fragmentation. Uh, another consideration is uh, this library ampl amplification step. So generally speaking, amplification uh, generally introduces errors. So generally speaking, uh, the kind of more involved your protocol is, the more steps there are, then the more chances are that you somehow uh, introduce some errors or bias into your fragments because, for example, with PCR amplification, um, not all reads may get equally uh, amplified. And so uh, when you're trying to decide on your exact library prep, you'd obviously have to decide whether or not you want to do some kind of, kind of amplification. Um, and the final consideration is basically the amount of, of DNA you have. And so certain technologies uh, like Illumina might need, uh, e might need a higher number of reads uh, to represent any given fragment in order for you to, to reliably sequence that fragment. Um, whereas other technologies uh, that are based on like single molecule sequencing uh, traditionally need less uh, input DNA material. And so this becomes important when you are sequencing certain samples that are, that are rare or are hard to find. So you could imagine that, for example, if you're sequencing uh, cells within a tumor, if you're trying to sequence, for example, so-called cancer stem cells, which are, you know, a rare population of, of cancer cells, um, you might not be able to get that many cancer stem cell cells, in which case you might need a, a protocol or technology that uses less input uh, genome material. And so again, the basic output of any of the sequencing te technologies that we talk about today uh, is basically a basically a set of reads. And so what exactly is a, a sequencing read? A sequencing read is really just a fragment of, of DNA sequence. So it's basically just a set of bases uh, from one region of the original input DNA sequence. And so between the different technologies that we'll talk about today, uh, there's various considerations that you need to think about in terms of the sequencing reads that you get out of these technologies. So for example, and we'll, we'll go into more detail about uh, what the trade-offs are between the different technologies. But basically, when you look across different technologies like Illumina versus, you know, PacBio or Nanopore, um, they generally differ in terms of, for example, runtime. So certain technologies are, you know, they, they do sequencing faster than others. Um, in terms of cost, generally speaking, uh, technologies that generate longer reads or they can sequence longer reads generally cost more than shorter read technologies like Illumina. Uh, a lot of these technologies differ in terms of their error rate, and so obviously sequencing is not a is not a one hundred percent accurate process, and so uh, certain technologies like Illumina uh, sequencing by synthesis, for example, tend to have a lower overall uh, error rate than compared to some of the longer read technologies. Um, another closely related consideration is that um, the error rate is is sometimes a function of the composition of the sequence. So for example, uh, Illumina technologies tend to be slightly worse at sequencing like GC rich uh, sequences, whereas other uh, technologies are, are less biased. Um, some other considerations are that, again, technologies like Illumina's uh, 
uh, sequencing by synthesis tend to sequence very short reads uh, compared to like PacBio or Nanopore that uh, can generate like hundreds of thousands of uh, base read pairs or uh, reads. And so why this is uh, why this matters is that obviously, at least in terms of, for example, genome assembly, as we'll see uh, later on in this lecture, um, because sequencing technologies can only sequence fragments of, for example, the original genome, that means that you have to do additional work in order to kind of piece together your short sequences back into the original genome sequence. And so that process is generally much easier when you're using longer read technologies compared with shorter read. Um, and finally, uh, another consideration is that certain protocols, well, so most sequencing done uh, nowadays involve what's what's called paired end sequencing. So what that means is that um, you, when you uh, generate these uh, fragments that you want to sequence, sometimes, for example, if you're using short read sequencing technologies, you can only sequence the ends of those fragments and not the whole fragment itself. Um, but most protocols nowadays allow you to do what's called paired end sequencing, which allow you to sequence kind of both ends of each uh, read. Uh, and so why that's useful is because if you know approximately what the length of your, of your fragment is uh, and you sequence both ends, then that means that you have, inf you know, even though you have two short uh, sequences produced from a single fragment, you know approximately how far they were on the original genome. And so that helps you when you when you go through the uh, genome assembly process. So the process of stitching back together your genome sequence from your from your short reads. And so the three kind of most common applications of genome or of DNA sequencing that we'll kind of go over in this lecture and later on are basically number one, genome assembly. So again, that's a process of you know, actually sequencing a, uh, the genome of an organism. Uh, number two of which is uh, what's called resequencing for variant detection. And so what that means is that suppose that you, you know, you're looking at a well-studied organism like human. Um, as, we, as we all know, humans have a lot of sequence variation between any given pair of individuals. And so resequencing is the process of um, trying to identify what those sequence variants are for any given individual in the case where you have a reference genome already. So for example, for the human genome, we already have like a reference human genome available. And so uh, if you want to figure out what sequence variants there are uh, for any given individual, you don't need to reassemble a, you know, the, new, you know, the new individual's genome from scratch. You can basically use the you know, reference genome as some kind of reference or scaffold from which you then kind of just try to figure out where the differences are uh, for any given individual. And the third um, set of applications that will actually occupy the vast majority of this class are basically what you could uh, think of as counting experiments, where basically, for example, for RNA sequencing, um, what that protocol, you know, what those protocols involve is basically extracting out RNA from cells, um, converting RNA to DNA, so that you can then use DNA sequencing technologies and then mapping those reads back to the genome and then figuring out um, basically based on where the reads align to your genome, um, you're trying to figure out which parts of the genome were transcribed uh, in a given set of cells. And so genome assembly is, is the topic of the next lecture, but just to summarize it in a nutshell, basically the idea is that you start out with some kind of genome sequence, which you're assuming is, is very long and then what you're doing is you're, you know, going through your uh, library prep process where you're fragmenting the genome, sequencing a bunch of reads. And then so the whole idea here is that uh, when you're doing genome sequencing, you obviously generally don't know what the original genome looks like. So all you have are the short, for example, reads that you've generated from your, say, Illumina sequencing technology. And so genome assembly is the general process of taking those reads and aligning them to each other so that you can kind of figure out which ones are overlapping. Um, and so here, what I'm showing you is the original genome sequence and uh, the reads and showing you, I'm showing you where those reads came from with respect to the original genome sequence. Although you don't know that when you, you know, generally doing genome sequencing. 
you use alignment to figure out which ones follow which other reads. And then in doing so, you can basically uh, reassemble the genome by, because if you know which reads overlap which other reads, then you can kind of order them from left to right and allow yourself to basically figure out what the original genome sequence was. And so in the process of um, resequencing for variant identification, as I mentioned in the previous uh, slides, basically the idea here is that you've, somebody's already generated a reference genome for you. For example, for the human genome, you have the draft human genome sequence, which you can download. Um, and the idea here is that if you have a new individual of that, uh, of that species that you're trying to detect you know, sequence variation of, what you do is you take that new individual, you would collect uh, DNA samples from them, and then you would, again, generate reads. And you would take those reads and you would map them back to this reference genome. And so the idea here is that because each individual has, you know, sequence variants that are specific to them, when you map these reads back to the reference genome, then for the most part, in the human genome, for example, for the most part, most reads should match more or less exactly back to the reference genome. But when you have positions in the individual's genome that differ from the reference, you're going to have a whole bunch of reads um, at, that basically consistently give you a different base at a position compared to the reference genome. And so here you can kind of see that by, if you look closely at the, at the gray boxes, which represent the individual reads, you can see that some of those gray boxes have uh, letters uh, or bases drawn on them. And those are meant to represent uh, variant sequence variants that are present in the individual you're sequencing, but are different from the reference genome. And so the idea is that, again, here I'm showing what I'm calling you, what I'm calling is the test genome is basically the new individual that you're sequencing. And the idea here is that um, there are certain positions in the test genome that are different from the reference genome. And you can tell that because when you look at the reference genome sequence, so uh, on the top, I'm now showing you some hypothetical uh, bases in the reference genome that differ from the test individual. And you can see that those particular columns of the reference genome, the reference base is different from that of the uh, of the individual you're sequencing. And so in the variant identification process, basically for each, uh, you know, for each position along the reference genome, you're kind of looking across the reads that you sequenced and you're basically looking for discordance. And where you see a lot of support, so where there's a lot of reads from your individual that uh, suggest one base that's different from the reference genome, then that's when you can be pretty sure that you've identified a variant specific to um, that individual that's different from the reference. And so an interesting question to think about is, you know, what would you expect to see for a heterozygous variant, right? So for humans, for example, uh, the human genome is diploid. And so if there's a specific SNP at a position in your genome and your individual is heterozygous in that SNP, then what would your reads look like at that particular site. So here, for example, um, if we're assuming we have a homozygous variant, then all of, for the rightmost column where the reference genome is an A, and in the test genome, I said there was a G, you can see that all of the reads from the individual mapping to that position uh, indicate there is a G at that position in the individual compared to the A in the reference. Um, but the question is, you know, what would you expect to see if you have a heterozygous variant?